So welcome to everybody. What do you see here is the 11th week of the drive techniques uh, presentation. And last week we were talking about torque curves of different engines and we were talking about how to fit the so-called work point to a, given, uh, to a given torque curve. We were talking about stability and instability of the working points. And also we were talking about uh, different layouts, the different organization of transmission chains uh, between or regarding to the engine and regarding to the kind of driving that we have. So we have seen last week that different transmission organization is required for a traditional gasoline engine and different uh, transmission layout is required for an electric engine depending on how it is built inside the car and how many time uh, or how many percentage of the lifetime of the car it has to work. And we were talking uh, of gearboxes and we were talking about reducers that both can be used with an electric engine but I was not talking about that what's the difference between them because there are shafts and bearings and, and gears gear pads in both what's the difference so this is the first thing uh, if I find my pencil obviously so to continue from the last week, then we have finished. Difference between reducer and gearbox. What's the basic difference? As a symbol, both are black boxes if you like you get power one entering and n number of revolutions entering sorry it's not power because the power is the same it's torque torque one entering and number of revolutions entering and torque going out and number of revolutions going out why i did use torque instead of power that's because obviously basic knowledge power is nothing else than torque times uh, omega omega being 2p times n so it's the rotational or it's the angular velocity and let's say p1 equals p2 if efficiency eta is let's suppose 100 percent for sake of simplicity so what is changing the torque and the uh, angular velocity or the number of rotations by unit. Okay, so what's the difference between reducer and gearbox? A reducer, reducer, here we get one, two, three gear pairs or if not gear pairs then planetary gear sets and either we get gear pairs or planetary gear sets the most important is that they are fixed they are always working. I mean by fixed, they are always working. The power is continuously growing, is going through these transmission ratios. Okay, all are always uh, engaged. engaged, yeah, engaged. All are always transmitting the power. This is a reducer. It's like an industrial gearbox, if you like. One shaft in, one shaft out, and between them, the power goes through all possible gears. Uh, if you want a sketch, a very simple gearbox for an electric car, you get here, let's say you get the motor, and then you get a gear at the end of the motor, 
and if you are lucky you get just this gear pair as reducer and outside you get the differential you get the differential outside roughly differential okay this is just as simple as this one one gear pair and nothing else Uh, the question was if we can say reduce reducers have got fixed ratio. Uh, for sure, yes. So we can say n2 by n1 equals, let's say, IR, reducer transmission ratio, and this is constant. Always the same. So in your models, you may use it just a simple multiplication, a simple block in MATCAD, or also in, 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 in MATLAB, and you are happy with that. If you want to go deeper, of course, you can play with gaps and backlashes and, and dampings on the level of T's, but roughly, as a first approach, it's a constant multiplication. If you get a gearbox, a gearbox is a bit a different thing. In a gearbox, you get usually from four till 10 gear pairs. Or planetary gear sets. And the basic difference is that uh, power flows through one or two of them. So let's say we get 10 pairs of gears and the power goes through just one pair of gears. Mm -hmm. But what about the others? The others are used to provide a different transmission ratio. And whenever we want a different transmission ratio, then we've got to shift gears. Shifting gears mean, means we have to change the orientation of the power flow from one gear pair to another gear pair. It seems again to be obvious, as many things in life, but the realization is not at all. Okay, so basic difference. That here, <coughs> we can shift the power from one gear pair to another. Shiftability is the key word. The shift ability exists, and this gives us a problem itself. Shift ability is a problem since at least 120 years. How to shift power from one gear pair to another gear pair? How to control when, why, which gear ratio to choose? Uh, it's a very well known uh, group of questions that we've got to answer. And during these lessons, I will just trying to give a rough approximation to show the 
different uh, limit conditions that influence the choice at the end. Okay? It's not by hazard that in the simpler electric cars we don't have a gearbox. The control of an electric motor, independently of each, its type, is much easier than the control of a gearbox. And also, the control of an electric motor is much easier than the control of an internal combustion engine. And nowadays, in these years when we are going through the all electric control, sometimes it's good to stop and remember that electric control cannot have good efficiency if we don't have efficient mechanical parts that we control. Okay? It's very important as a first thing. And second thing, if you pro want to design engine, engines, not engines, but uh, complex mechanical systems that work at different operating conditions, in military conditions, in agriculture, in, in naval ap uh, applications, so in the middle of the sea. Uh, electric control is a nice and important thing, but let's see if your device is just flying on Mars. You have limited access to mechanical parts. You can refresh the softwares in a limited way, but if your wings or your rotors broke, it's over with the machine. So you may have the best quality of electric control, but if your mechanical parts are not as good in design and manufacturing, you are just lost. OK, this is for, for basic consideration. And based on that, I will continue about about, uh, about the mechanical side of the transmission. So what comes next? I will focus on gearboxes, okay? Because it's a very interesting, very interesting uh, domain. And with the arrival of electric engines, electric trucks, electric buses, electric everything, we will have more and more important things to learn and to make inside gearboxes. And we have to learn and make important things regarding shiftability, shift control, and mechanical parts that allows a good shift control. Okay, so now, let's have some words about how to find the gear ratio for a vehicle. Case of uh, fixed ratios. That means gear pair. How to find transmission ratios for a given vehicle? You may have bicycle, you may have a locomotive, you may have even a ship, or you may have even a, a propeller-driven aircraft. You've got to find the, the appropriate gear ratio. What is next? I'm talking, I will talk about only restriction. I will talk about only uh, but vehicles that have got wheels, either rubber wheels, so that goes in the road, or steel wheels that goes in rails. But I will talk about um, vehicles having wheels. So ships and airplanes excluded in this case. What to consider?
for reload vehicles. No, let's see the points of view. First thing that we can consider is the maximum climbing ability. Let's call it alpha angle max. You have to go uphill on a road and depending on your country, if it's a, mount, uh, a country full of mountains, for sure you know what is the maximum alpha that you get on your roads. If it's 20 degree, 30 degree, 35 degree of slope, and your vehicle should go, should be able to go uphill. Luckily we are a, in a quite flat country, so for us it's not a, not a challenge. So if you live in Iraq, for example, it's not a challenge because it's more or less flat. If you live in Liban, it's a challenge because it's full of mountains. The same if you live in Russia, European part of Russia, it's mostly you get small, small hills, but not too big mountains. If you live in Switzerland, mountain go and up and down. Croatia. Croatia also is full of mountains. So it depends on regions. Italy also, there are large mountains in Italy. Then you also may have a minimum a minimum constant velocity. It seems to be strange, but it's a very important factor. There are special cases when your vehicle should be able to go slowly, really slowly and for a long time. What are these cases? For example, you are making vehicles for military use and you've got the infantry that goes forward with a medium speed of three to four kilometers by hour. This is the walking speed of a human. And the tanks, the, the trucks and so should follow it for half a day or one day without overheating or without any engineering failure due to this slow speed. The same thing is true for, uh, for example, for funeral vehicles that go in front of the people with the body of the deceased uh, person. And this also should go quite slowly to allow to elder uh, relatives to follow. These are quite specific cases, but they exist. Okay, so v min is also a very important uh, uh, requirement. And also maximum constant velocity, so Vmax. Let's say your car is intended to be uh, sold in Germany, so if you want to have good sales, it should go at least by 200 uh, by hour, in kilometer by hours, or 250 kilometer by hour constantly. So it should be able to keep high speed for, let's say, infinity time. And if you look at these requirements, these are the basic requirements for every vehicle, you may say, for this, for slow speed or big slope, you need a large opa, ratio required. So here in these cases, your engine can spin quickly while the vehicle goes forward slowly. And in the third case, here you get small ratio required. So here your engine may, quick, may turn quickly, but also your wheel will turn quickly to reach the high speed. Uh, 
Exactly, exactly. So, quest, so question was that is it the case for, for long driving? Uh, is it the case for, for, so this is the speed that we can sustain without overheating in a normal conducting state, without tuning, without any special inter, inter, um, intervention in the car? Yes, this is the case. So every car has, a, has got a, a basic designed top speed. For a truck, it's around 90 to 100 kilometer by hour. For a sports car, it's 250 kilometer by hour or above, it depends. And what you see here, that these things, large ratio or small ratio, they are quite opposite requirements. So we cannot, have in a, we cannot have in the same time a large and small ratio. We cannot have the same time black and white sheep. This is different unless, unless some cases. So usually to overcome this, we need more than one fixed ratio. Okay, this is easy like that. If we accept that we need more than one, then we are free to choose one large ratio for going slowly or going uphill, and we can choose one small ratio when we can go in with the required top speed for a long time. I remark that this top speed is usually designed for a flat road without any wind that goes against the speed. Okay? So we get I max and we get I min we get two transmission ratios, roughly. And how many gear ratios are required? It depends on two things, the engine characteristics so how the torque curve looks like roughly and the second thing is how the vehicle looks like. Vehicle characteristics. And type. For example, if you get a strong engine, you can put in a passenger car and then you get a powerful passenger car. Or also, you can put it in a small truck, and you may have a quite uh, weak, not too powerful small truck. Why do you get the same engine? Okay, so that's why you've got to consider roughly both. Okay, so for having an information and an overall view, Let's see some cases. Let's see some cases. Cases. Let's say electric engine. It's 
small passenger car. Small passenger car and Vmax maximum speed is below 130 km by hour, which is in Europe the standard speed at highways. So regularly you cannot go quicker in most of the European countries, except Germany, of course, when you have no speed limit in some highways. Autobahn. In the Autobahn, yeah. And the Germans do go fast in these portions. So just a remark. In Europe, maybe you know, in highways, the slower guys should go on the left, sorry, in the right lane on the side of the road so that the quicker could pass quickly on the left side in the, in the internal ways. In the United States, if I remember, you can go at any speed at any lane of the highway. It's a quite a cultural uh, challenge to accept it, but in Europe you cannot. So the slower cars on the side of the road, on the side lanes, the faster in the internal lanes, usually. This is how it happens here. And in Germany, you've got to watch your left mirror to see how fast the car arrives before you want to overtake, really, really. Because it can be really fast, and if you go fast, the braking distance increases with the square of the speed. Don't forget this because you can find yourself surprised. So, here, electric engine, small passenger car, VMAX is relatively small, then you need a reducer is enough. And you get one ratio, one gear ratio, and no more else. If you got steel electric engine, but you get a large passenger car, let's say a sports car or SUV with large cross-section and large uh, wind resistance, air resistance. And then you get a Vmax inferior or equal to 250 km by hour, which is the standard for German manufacturers for the autobahns with no speed limit. For sure you will need one or two, maybe two transmission ratios gearbox one two ratios one for starting and the second for going at high speed or one for normal use and the second ratio for going at really keeping high speed to keep the engine rpm low Then, other types, you get just an internal a gasoline engine, small gasoline engine. And then, then, then let's say you get a small motorbike, let's say a moped, motorbike with pedals. Well, the design speed VMAX in Europe is inferior or equal to 45 km by hour which is a quite theoretical one because nobody goes so slowly, even in cities, unless in Germany and Holland, of course, because Germans are really following the rules. Uh, but if your engine is gasoline engine, your vehicle is a moped, so a small motorbike with pedals, a slow one, and the top speed is really slow, then one or two gear ratio
are enough because you don't have to reach high speed. You don't need too many gain ratios. And what else? You get still an internal combustion engine. That can be either gasoline engine or diesel engine. And you get a passenger car as we get it in Europe. And let's say the top speed VMAX is a German usual speed, 250 kilometer by hour. I don't want to say by here that all the German cars go at 200 by hours. I say usual design speed, okay? The car is designed to keep this speed without problem. But usually the people in Germany also goes slowly, much slower than 200 by hour. So for that, we know it since quite long time that the optimal case is when we get no more than seven speeds. So I say here we get five to seven gear ratios. Seven being the optimum, the best choice between efficiency and weight and complexity. This has been computed by Germans 30 years before. That seven gear ratio for an internal combustion engine is the optimal number for gears for a passenger car. And if we consider trucks, it's a bit different. So again, internal combustion engine And we get trucks. So camions transporting heavy load. And for sure, the VMAX is inferior or equal to 90 kilometer by hour. Why is this limit? That's because of the case that they, large and heavy vehicles, have to stop. They have, exactly, they have high kinetic energy. And in order to not to overload the brakes, they just cannot go faster than 90 km by hour. There are some buses that, they are, that are allowed to go faster in Europe, up to 110 km by hour but they should, be uh, they should be provided with special brakes, stronger brakes that allow to stop the bus transporting humans uh, from uh, this higher speed. But for an ordinary truck, for example, transporting wood or transporting bricks, I don't know, rather mention these, it's just 90 by hour, which is allowed. Obviously they go sometimes faster, but it's not allowed, in fact. And then, as they use diesel engines, and diesel engines are known to have a very narrow, useful power domain, so here we get five to 18 gear ratios. And five is a normal case for a smaller truck, let's say a 3.5 ton truck, but for a 40, 42, 45 ton truck, for sure it has at least 16 gears, mechanical gears. So a complicated gearbox structure is required. And for the complexity of the gearbox, in the United States you have heard about the twin stick gearboxes. When the truck drivers have to handle two gear shift levers because the 16, 18 uh, gears are grouped in special gearboxes, special layouts, and sometimes for gear changing, 
the truck drivers have got to use just one gear level, but often they've got to use both shifting wing final level, shifting with the second level, and then this is when the new gear is engaged. And this is where the automatization of the gear changing has started, let's say in the last 20 years. And we get interesting results also here in the department regarding the automatization of gear shifting. When we were student, we were allowed to drive a small truck, five ton or 10 ton truck, the test, test, uh, the test field. And it was really interesting to see how we have to change gears, how we have to have uh, to handle this large number. It had maybe eight gears, eight or ten gears, not more. But how to play with the and it has just it had just one gear lever, so we had to learn how to play and how to shift between the high and low five or high and low four gears, and how to handle. We don't did not have twin sticks as in the U.S but it was quite interesting to see how we have to change gears and also how we can brake with such large vehicle. It was not obvious, even if it was empty. And also we could test the ABS, how to go forward braking and go in front by the side of the, of the camion. It was a very important experience, not because we wanted to be a camion driver, all of us, but to understand the behavior. So if in windy road, if, if on a icy road, we, we are driving around a track like that, it's better to keep distance in front, after, and on both sides. Because if a, such a large truck starts to move uncontrollable by an uncontrollable, uncontrolled way, one thing we can do is to not to be there, for sure. It's like with, with elephants. If they start to move in an uncontrolled way, it's better to be away of it. Okay. So, this is what we can see roughly. And you see it's large, so the, the spectrum is large, from one gear ratio till 18 uh, gear ratio, uh, depending on the type of vehicle and depending on the type of engine that do we use in these cases. So even such a simple looking thing that the choice of, of gear ratios is not obvious at all, unfortunately. Now, let's continue from here. So how many gear ratios? We have ideas from here. And now comes the thing, one more thing, how to choose them, in fact. So the question that you can arise, that you can ask why so many variations in gear ratio number. This is a basic question. Why do we need just one in some cases? And why do we need up to 18 in other cases? And it's really, really uh, not so complicated if you have followed the previous uh, lesson. So what is fixed? What is given? We have computed I max, maximum ratio, and I min, minimum ratio, for sure. I max is required for climbing the hills, and I min is required for going at high speed, depending on the type vehicle, of vehicle and depending on the, uh, on the requirements. And what counts? Hmm. It 
is the work point uh, work point moving during changing so we were talking about last week that the work point can be stable and can be unstable depending on its position on the torque curve of, curve of the engine and the number of speeds number of gear ratios is essentially depending on this fact so what we want is the following I'm again making a sketch we made a lot of sketch like this last week horizontal axis we get the engine RPM engine uh, rotation by minute and vertical axis we get a torque in let's say Newton meters and if I draw a torque curve let's have a diesel engine for example I get n min smallest possible RPM and max maximum allowed RPM for long uh, time use these are very important points here n min minimal allowed RPM let's say the idling RPM and the nmax is that we allow for making or ex extracting power of the engine. The engine can turn, of course, more quickly, but not for an infinite time, for an infinite duration. Okay? So nmax is given by the, the, the place when you can load the engine constantly without failure okay if you make tuning and you uh, you 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 set or you uh, uncheck or you switch off the nmax limit for sure your engine can turn much more quickly but in this case the failure will appear much also much more quickly so here I say I get an engine with a given gear ratio. I'm trying to have a different pencil. I get an engine at a given gear ratio that turns around this point. This is P1, point P1. And I don't like to turn my engine at high RPM. I want to have a more stable, less noisy, less fuel consuming, either gasoline consuming or electric current consuming case. So what I propose is to decrease the engine RPM. I'm going on a flat road, so I want to go either quicker or having less noise and less consumption. And I want to set a point somewhere here with less RPM and I want to set my work point there to P2 okay and we can say if if I say if V equals constant so if the vehicle speed is not changing then V can be described by N1 times I. Let's index it by I, small i. So here we get N I, uh, and here this is N1, and here we get N2. And on the top, we get third N, and then the torque is max and n max okay so we get three numbers of rpm so if v equals constant then we can say what we can say 
bn1 equals nothing else than n2 times i, i plus 1, the next gear ratio. Okay? And here, where n2 is smaller than n1 for decreasing the fuel consumption or the current consumption of the engine. And this distance as such is inferior or equal to our case, our definition of stability. So here N2, wait a bit, wait a bit, wait a bit. I'm confusing here the sign. I have to check the differences. N2 minus N, hoppa, hoppa, hoppa. No, again, I got to recheck this. So here N1 minus N2 should be inferior or equal to N torque max minus, uh, 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 uh. yeah, 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 I'm confusing myself. So N2 minus N torque max like this, okay? This is a very important condition here. So to visualize this segment should be smaller than that segment. Okay, this is the meaning. Why? This segment should be smaller than that segment. So the max speed is uh, less than N. You say we don't want to exceed, we, want, we don't want to reach the maximum torque point, but <coughs> we have learned just the last week that this side of the torque curve is the stable side. So this condition tells us we will keep on the st stable side of the torque curve, okay? So here <coughs> we have to stay on the stable side of the torque curve, for sure. And this is the most important thing. That's why we have different number of ratios. The single purpose is to keep on the stable side of the torque curve, okay? And this, gives us to the next <coughs> idea. So from that, if the stable side is narrow, and we want to have a certain speed in the vehicle, then for sure, we need uh, how to say it we need many more gear ratios okay just an example if you consider for example, like a Ford Model T, which is a very old car, 100 years old car. It has just two speed ratios. And why? Because of the, com it, it's because of the simplicity of the building. And also because the torque curve of the engine is almost flat. So you get a large, large, large stable domain. And you just don't need more gear issues. With the development of the internal combustion engines, the, the engine became more and more powerful. But 
exactly, but it was uh, in the same time, it resulted that the power went out in a narrower range. And this had happened <coughs> till the 1980s, by the end of the 1980s. And from the 1980s in Europe, the emission standards became more and more strict. So the next very important point was not to make more powerful car, because we could do it without problem, but we, the point was to not to lose power while satisfying the strict emission requirements. And this double exigence, again, it made the power range, the useful stable power range, narrower and narrower. If you consider an actual European engine, which has got a medium engine size of, internal combustion engine size of one liter, 1.5 liter, you get three cylinder engines. If it's a turbocharged engine, you get more than 100 horsepower out of one to 1.5 liter of volume, swept volume. So you get a very narrow power domain. The extreme example can be found or could be found in the 50cc Grand Prix engines of the 60s and 70s. In the 1960s, 1970s, you could extract 20 horsepower from a 50 cubic centimeter engine. Can you imagine this? 20 horsepower out of 50 cubic centimeter, half deciliter of swept volume. How was it possible? Either by the fact that you had two or three cylinders to form together this 50 cc, and the useful power range was in a 500 RPM narrow zone. Let's say between 90,500 and 20,000. So you had uh, 12 to 16 gears for a 50 cc engine in the racing motorbikes. So the width of the engine was this one and the width of the gearbox was this one, the double, which was for sure not normal at all. Okay, so we have to find a kind of equilibrium between the, 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 the stable engine output zone in the torque curve and the need for gear ratios. And this is not helped by the emission standards here in Europe. But unfortunately, this is the case worldwide. So as we have no planet B, we have to satisfy some exigencies to, to save the, the planet for our children and grandchildren. Now, so another requirement, contemporary. requirements minimal emission and maximal efficiency that are the same in fact an efficient internal combustion engine consumes less and an efficient electrical engine also consumes less. And just to show 
the things. You've got the power band for optimal efficiency. If you get an internal combustion engine, torque, RPM. Let's say you get torque curve like this. You get N min, N max. You get a peak torque somewhere here. You get the RPM for N max. And we want to see the efficiency on this curve. The efficiency can be shown by that. We will have the efficiency in seashell looking curves in zones like this and we will get the maximum efficiency let's say somewhere here this is eta max so one further point of view for gear charging not only the stability of the transmission as such but also keeping the engine the closest possible to the optimum efficiency that can exist. You may say it's a stupidity from the point of view of, uh, that it just satisfies the, 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 the climate protection laws. And you may say it, for sure. If you are working in the army, Usually you are focused on having powerful things, powerful tracks, powerful tanks, powerful guns, and so on, and so on, and so on. Note one thing. In the Second World War, the Germans were using the best tanks of that time, at least in the beginnings. Not, not in the, at, the, at the end, not in the beginnings, at the end, sorry. In 45, 44, 43. The Panther and Koenig Panther and so on. But all these tanks had gasoline engines and they were really, really heavy. And they were consuming a lot. While the Russians, after a long decision, started to use diesel engines. Their tanks, the TF-34, they were much weaker than the German super tanks, but they were easier and cheaper to manufacture and could go 500 kilometers by one refueling. And in military, it can be an important point to see what is the consumption and how and when to refuel your military vehicles. Of course, the cost of manufacturing is also an, uh, a point, but in operation, once it's in operation, the, the time for maintenance and refueling is as much important. So a German super tank could go 100 kilometers and then require refueling of expensive uh, aviation gas, gasoline, while a Russian tank had, Russian tank needed just a cheap gasoline diesel oil, and it could go five times more. And it was much cheaper to produce. And just look at the maps. There are more Russians than Germans. And the Russian territory is larger than the German territory. So obviously, you can see there are chances to win each other. Okay. So if you are dealing with military uh, problems and military, how to explain it in English? Uh, 
not standard, but, but goals. Performance, not performance, uh, strategy, that's the word, strategy. And if you have to choose between different types of engines, different types of load carrying capacity, and so on and so on, please not watch only the power, but also other points of view. Okay, it's quite important. It's quite important. So here, if I want to design the changing, the gear changing, also a point is that if I change gears from this point to that point, from this point to that point, my overall consumption will be much less than if I change from this point to that point, from this point to that point. Okay? And uh, this is exactly the case these days. I'm just drawing a second torque curve now for electric engines. So this is for internal combustion engine. And the same for electric engines. I will have a rough torque curve like this. And if I want to draw the efficiency curves, uh, one more thing here. As you know here, eta max, opa, max efficiency, let's say a rough value is less than 30%. I know that modern diesels can go up to 40, 45% in ships, but we are dealing with road vehicles that have got wheels I say around 30% is a good diesel engine, commercial diesel engine, roughly. Uh, and now, let's, and here, uh, outside, it's worse and worse and worse and worse. Okay. For an electric engine, what do we have? We have these shapes, an asynchronous engine, again in seashell, but in a different layout like this, and here in this zone, here we get eta max, maximum torque, which is roughly around 95%. And you may be happy saying, ah, an electric engine is fantastic, it has so much efficiency, oh, let's change all the vehicles in the, in the streets to electric ones, uh, for sure. But, and comes the but. The 30% is the overall uh, efficiency from putting in the fuel and getting the mechanical work out. While 95% here is the ratio of giving the current, the tension to the bonds of the electric engine and getting out the power on the wheels. But if you consider that also you get an um, inverter, a frequency control device in the electric car, plus you get a charging device, charging unit in the electric car, this efficiency goes down considerably. I have measured myself the efficiency of charging. You plug it in the wall, you measure the current, and you get internal canvas for showing the charging current to the battery. And between you get the charging unit. And I've got measured myself 50% uh, of efficiency. And this 50 is much closer to the 30 than you thought. And from this 50% of current that goes into the battery, you, you use a certain percentage to heating up the battery, to cooling down the battery in, in some, certain cases. And the remaining goes for sure to the engine. That will have a perfect efficiency. And also, just think about military applications. 
the diesel oil or the gasoline, you just store it in, in what is the English name for that? Yeah, in, 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 in barrels. You get one barrel and you get enough energy to, to, to a truck for working all day long. Unfortunately, you cannot do the same with batteries. <laughs> For sure. And even if you want to fill up a truck for a, for, a, for a complete barrel, it will not take more than 10 minutes, for sure. While if you want to charge your battery in your military vehicle, you have got limited current and you won't wait one hour for charging, for sure. In the actual state of the art, obviously, we are in 2021. Maybe it will change soon in some years, but actually this is the case. So, and again, for trucks and heavy buses, you get, which color to use? You get this zone here to use. If you want to have 40 tons payload for a camion, or you want to have a large bus driven by electric motor. Okay? So it is really not obvious how to handle these things. And uh, that's why, that's why, that's why, that's why, opa, I just want to have my paper. And that's why, if you think about these things, I wrote here electric engine. So if you think about these things, you may say, it was the yellow pencil, you get here the P1, and you get here the P2, and here again, let's say you get here the P1, and you get here the P2. Okay, and again, you see, you need a larger number of gear ratios here than previously, and here you, you need a gearbox instead of a reducer. Okay? So fortunately, uh, yeah. no, 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 no. Again, I repeat for the question that for the internal combustion engine, we need different gear ratios for sure. Mm -hmm. The question is how much, and it depends, it depends on the number of, it depends on the type of vehicle and the type of engine. If it's a two-stroke engine, if it's a four-stroke engine, with a small volume or with a large volume of, of, uh, of, of, of you know, of Hubraum in German, uh, swept volume, yeah, in English. Okay, if you get a larger engine and it's a gasoline engine, you need less gears. If you get a larger engine and it's a turbocharged diesel engine with small efficient zone, you need a large number of gears. Okay. So for any case, you've got to look at this curve, the torque versus RPM curve. This is the starting point of transmission design. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now the case of the electric engine, it's similar. You have a look, you have a torque curve, and you look at the vehicle that this engine has to drive. If you get a small passenger car, a K car in Japan or, or some other small sized car, you get a reducer, you don't have to use gear changing at all. If you get a Tesla, which is a larger car, either you use gear changing or you use double engines. One constantly driving and a second driving at more for requirement. Or you are doing like the Porsche Taycan, when you get one gear for quick launch, quick, quick acceleration, and you get a second gear, which is for normal drive and high speed drive. And if you are driving a truck, then you've got to follow and to watch these efficiency zones because the truck 
uh, carries a heavy load usually, even if it's just 3.5 tons. And also you have to keep the autonomy of the electric car, the distance that it can uh, make between two charges. Okay. So in passenger car, regular passenger car, not too quick, it's not required. The user is enough. But to a high speed passenger car that wants to go really high, at really high speed for a long time, for sure you need a gearbox. Example again, I was talking with guys using Tesla Model S and I was making taxi service between Budapest and Vienna. This is 240 kilometers. And there's a highway between the two cities. And though the Tesla is spectacular and powerful in acceleration, I, will talk, I was talking about regarding the batteries, maybe some weeks before. If you want to go fast constant, at constant speed, let's say at 130 km by hour, which is regular speed in highways, by the time you arrive to Vienna, you've got to recharge the car. not going for, uh, for, the, for the full range. If you want to go a long distance with an electric car, you can do it by going slowly, not on the highway. In the city for sure, in national roads, when the speed limit is 80 or 90 or 100, it depends, you can do it for sure, but the range, the autonomy on a national road will be higher than on highway. That's because the electric car knows perfectly the, the physics. If you are on an uphill road, the autonomy decreases. If there are more than one passenger, the autonomy decreases. If there is headwind, the autonomy decreases. If it's too cold, you've got to heat up the battery, the autonomy decreases dramatically. If it's too hot, you've got to cool down the battery. Again, the autonomy decreases. So the driving an electric car is purely uh, applying the practical physics. Okay? So in buses and trucks, the problem is much more important because of the larger carrying weight. That's why you don't have so much electric buses now. In five to 10 years, you will have a lot, but not now. Okay. Now, let's continue from here. So I was at the choice of number of gear ratios still. Choice of the number of gear ratios. And so this means that if we have to keep inside the maximum efficient the maximum efficiency eta max zone, what we can do we can have eight to 10 gear ratios. We get the luxury passenger cars. Mercedes, Maybach, large BMWs. They have a lot of gear ratios. And it sounds good, let's say 12 cylinder engine plus a 10, cylinder, 10, 10 gear gearbox. And while the 12 cylinder engine is just for the prestige in China or other countries, in Saudi Arabia. The 10 or 8 to 10 gear ratio 
is purely for keeping the emission levels at an acceptable level. Because with 9 to 10 gear ratios, your engine, your internal combustion engine goes always in the very close neighborhood of the optimum efficiency. In exchange, you get a heavy and complicated gearbox for sure. But this is how you can satisfy the European emission standards and having a large engine together. Okay? And for electric vehicles, for sure you will have five to four gear ratios. Electric trucks. and Formula A race cars. Maybe they don't have so many gears now, but they will have it for sure once the requirement will be to have a complete race distance without recharging the batteries. Because to increase the Autonomy increase the, the driving distance between two rechargings can go only through watching the efficiency more closely. And this is not a new thing if you have a look at it. Just compare, just compare the approach of Hyundai and Tesla. Tesla works mainly for the US market where the distances are more or less large, people are more or less fat like I am, and uh, the speeds are, allowed speeds are not too high. So they can build a large car, put a lot of batteries in the floor of the car, and they can go for moderate speeds for a long distance. In Korea, South Korea, a lot of, lot of people. There are not so big distances, but also there are not so many energy. It's a poorer country, relatively. It's a rich country, but a bit poorer than the US, United States. So what they do, they try to optimize everything. Good efficiency transmission, good efficiency tires, good efficiency uh, internal, everything a very flat and low for, uh, front cross-section, plus a good uh, drag coefficient. And while a Tesla has a range of, I don't know, 400 kilometers, but it's close to a two-ton car and has got, I don't know how much, the 40 to 50 kilowatt hour battery. <laughs> for example, the Hyundai Ioniq has got 20 to 30 or 25 kilowatt hour battery. So let's say the quarter to what we see, half or quarter to what do we see in the Tesla Model S. And can go, let's say, the two third of, of, of range of autonomy. So the expensive part, the battery, is much smaller, but the range is not so less, okay? So efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. It has no gearbox, just a reducer, but the efficiency, okay? Uh, for sure, the price of the batteries will decrease because there will be more and more, so the price by unit will decrease. But uh, it's also for sure that uh, the efficiency of the electrical transmission, the overall efficiency from the plug in the wall till the wheels will be more and more important. Okay, good. And now, how to compute how to compute the intermediate gears.
gear ratios. Okay, once we know what we want to do, we can start to compute. It's really easy. Let's have Z gears, Z gear ratios. And there's a basic thumb rule to compute. Let's have a number phi or phi, which is nothing else than z minus once z minus once root of i max divided by i min. Okay, this is a ratio here. And this will give us a geometric suite for the gear ratios. So then i ratio n plus one, the next ratio will be nothing else than i n times the three. So it will be a geometric suite for the gear ratios. Okay? You have learned this in maths. Mathematical or arithmetical suites and geometrical suites where the arithmetical suite was then n plus one be equals n plus something, a constant. The geometrical suite was n plus one equals n times a constant. Okay. And how to visualize this? There's also a simple tool for visualizing. Visualization is quite simple. We call it here the Hirman diagram. We also call it so diagram. And it looks the following. You get here a vertical and horizontal axis. On the horizontal axis you get the velocity of the crankshaft or the engine output shaft, depending on the engine, which one you get. And in RPMs, let's say, and here you get the speed in kilometer by hours. So for RPMs in inter internal combustion engines, you get limits for sure and mean and max and then how to proceed here for sure you get a given low speed value so you can draw a line this is the constant lower speed you get a second line for the top speed, here you get V max, V min, and you have to define what's between them. And how you define? You draw the intermediate gears. Intermediate gears, I want to draw how many? Let's say one, two, like this. Okay, so it's ratio one, ratio two, ratio three, ratio four. Okay? The choice can be given 
depending on your engine and your vehicle. And so from one till 18, you may have a different number, number between these uh, red lines. Okay. And one more thing before finishing, that this is a very mathematical approach to the thing. But if you are really driving a real vehicle, usually having much choice is important in the domain of high speeds. If you want to make an overtaking, if you want to make a, you tow a caravan uphill or downhill, uh, it's better if you get more possibilities to choose in the zone of higher speeds. Why I say this? Because usually we slightly differ of this ideal phi. We change a bit the transmission ratios. So if drivability or the driving feel is important, We make a slight changing in that. I draw it again. And manually, we, try, we start to tune the speed ratios. And RPM. There were two limits, as usual. And, 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 so we had something like that, horizontally, this one, and vertically, it was quite high. It was V min and V max. So we rearrange a bit the ratios manually, we make a fine tuning. And we say the following, maybe we make the upper gears a bit closer. Do you see the difference? Mm -hmm. So we make the ratios closer in the upper zone and we leave bigger gap in the lower speed zone. Okay. What does it mean? It means that I upper by I, I minus one is smaller distance than I, I plus one, I lower. Okay, so we don't keep the ideal phi, but we get a smaller number for the upper gears and the larger number here for the lower gears. Sorry, I did not understand the question. Previous figure. Here, here. we can have more speeds, more gear ratios to keep in this zone. This is one thing. This is influencing the number of speeds. Mm -hmm. Instead of four speed, we use six speeds. Mm -hmm. This is, that gives an approach, more focus in this zone, mm -hmm. the number, yeah. just the number. Yeah. And here on this picture, I'm talking about drivability. Yes. How comfortable? Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. But the difference is different. Just an example. English motorbikes. Norton, Triumph, famous English motorbikes. They all used a four-speed gearbox. The 
because the gearbox housing was expensive to spawn. In normal road vehicles, the gears were somehow like that. First, second, third, fourth. So they started, they went up till a given speed in first, then they switched to the second, again they accelerated, then switched to the third, accelerated, switched to the fourth. Okay. And when the gearbox should go in a racing motorbike, they have changed completely the ratios, but they have placed just for 40. What you know, what do you know? You know that the racing motorbikes go fast. Mostly, and they move every speed in this zone. So the lowest was somewhere here, and the two intermediate in this zone. Exactly. So for starting, you had to slip the clutch till 50 km by hour. And once you've reached this speed, then over you had close grid ratios for having always the maximum power domain for the engine. But for starting, it was really miserable. OK? And if you want to compare for a purely geometric gearbox, you should have this ratio, point switching point here, again switching point here, and again switching point somewhere here. Do you see? Mm -hmm. The blue legs, it's more or less vertical, while it has a sl slope. Is it clear now? Okay. This slope you decide yourself. Or you use a second order geometric suite or third order geometric suite when have you learned about the Fibonacci numbers? Fibonacci suites. No. So here you get the following in this case, you get the following approach. You get ratio I1, I2, I3, and here you get Q phi 1, phi 2, and so on. And here you get, let's say, gamma. And this is always, at the gamma level, that it is constant. Here you get the gear ratios, first, second, third, I max. Here I say if it's geometrically purely, then you get phi, 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 always the same phi. In this case, you don't have it. You get phi one, phi two, till phi n. But if again you check the relationship the ratio of these, you may find a constant one uh, level below in mathematics. Okay? This is how you can arrange these zones. So here, y2 by y1 is phi1, and it's not the same, but one level below, phi2 by phi1, it can be gamma. And phi3 by phi2, it can be also gamma. The same ratio. Okay? Is it clear? No, good. I think I have told everything for today. I hope it was more or less easy to catch and to understand. And students, you will have a test today at five o'clock as usual. And then we see each other in the next week at a different time, but for sure we will see each other. We will discuss about what time it will be. Okay, thank you for watching, thank you for coming, and see you on next week.